Hello and welcome to Gaming Like It's 1979. Today we're going to have a fun one. We're going to be looking at a very obscure game called Bloody Murder by Arthur Wells Jr. Now this is a fascinating game and Arthur Wells is an interesting guy. So this game is written nominally in integer basic. So we have booted off of the Apple II DOS version 3.3 system master, which is going to have loaded integer basic into our language card. Let's look at the disk here. We're looking at the uh, disk drive two, and we can see there are a number of programs here, many of which have the file type I which stands for integer basic. Now we could switch to integer basic by typing int like so. We get a different prompt. We can get back to AppleSoft by typing FP, or if you load an integer basic program, it will tell us that it's an integer program by showing the prompt. And there it is. There are also some binary files associated with this. You can see these sub BM1 and sub BM2 files here. We'll talk about what those are later. Well, we're going to look at the code here and it's very interesting code. First, we've got a bunch of what looks like um, uh, we load in those binary files that we talk about. And then there's a bunch of drawing calls that are called only once. And these are going to be used to draw the play field that the game is played on. Then starting around line 525, things get really weird because there's almost nothing here. There's a bunch of pokes and there's some peaks and a few for loops, which are being used for delays. And then that's it. It ends just, this is maybe what, 20 lines of code, 30 lines of code. And what I believe is going on here is that the bulk of the program is actually written in assembly language. And this is essentially a um, framework to call into that code. Then we have a bunch of the explanatory text. This is the stuff that prints at the beginning of the game, explains how it works. It asks you one question, which has to do with the speed. We can see here on line 15, lines 15, 10 through 1570, um, depending on whether you type S, M, or F, it pokes a different value into this one place in memory, which I believe is a delay loop. So slow is going to delay more, that's that 64 value on line 1550, than fast. And then there's some finishing up, and then we have some just some comments here. So we see the name of the author, Arthur Wells Jr. He mentions that he uh, uses some of Andy Hertzfeld's high-res location routines and the Apple Talker software. So we're going to get to hear the Apple II talk. This is very exciting. And then we've got the LHS character font generator. And what that tells us, that tells us how the animation for this game was done. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Let's actually run the program and see how it looks. All right, so let's go ahead and ask for the instructions, making sure our caps lock key is on because this game cares about, this game was written probably at a time when lowercase was not common at all on Apple II, if it even existed in 1979. I actually have not checked the timeline to remember that. The men run back and forth and throw knives at each other. Oh, this is going to be a bloody game. The name of the game is Bloody Murder. Uh, there will be, I want to give a content warning, there will be a little bit of cartoon violence in this game. It's pretty silly. I don't think it's very serious. But if you are sensitive to that type of thing, you might uh, consider uh, hitting pause at this point. We've got pushing the button on the paddles. One, pe one button makes the top man throw a knife. The other button makes the lower man throw a knife. After someone dies, hit return if you want to play again, and hit escape if you don't. Very simple game. An explanation here that sometimes when you hit your opponent, you only wound him and he doesn't die. I think that is Arthur Wells' way of saying that the collision detection routines in the game are not that great. And he also notices that it'll noted noted <laughs> he also notes that it'll happen more often if you're hitting the buttons a lot. So that tells us that the Apple II is struggling a bit to keep up with the inputs. All right, so let's have them run at a medium speed here. 
And here we are. We have a top man. I'm going to hit the S key to move right, the A key to move left. So what's going on here? We saw that and there's almost no um, code dealing with the animation, right? Well, what's going on? Let's have them throw some knives. What's going on, I think, is that these are not sprites in the common sense of the word. The Apple II had no sprite hardware like, say, the Atari or the Commodore 64. What it did have was pretty decent text handling. And so there was a, a software package. This is what was referred to um, in the comments as a character generator. There is a software package that basically used text characters as graphics. So if we were to flip over into text mode right now, we would not see these various lines drawn on the screen. Those were drawn with the plot commands that we saw at the beginning of the program. But we would see probably text in the same locations as the men. So let's see if I can, standing still, actually throw a knife that hits my opponent. Let's try that one more time. Isn't that great? Just digitized voice from 1979. What happens here? Let's uh, let's have the lower man actually. Uh, oh, I guess I could just have him walk all the way over there. Let's have him throw a knife. So same text, just in a lower pitched voice. So I'm going to leave a demo running where I had a couple people play each other for about uh, a few minutes. And I'll leave that running while I talk about this game. I want to assure you that in 1979, the fact that this game talked was amazing. Yes. Arthur Wells was using this Apple Talker framework. Not a lot of games spoke at this point, certainly very few on the Apple II that I can think of. Um, the, the first game that I think most people had widespread exposure to, the first home computer game that most people had widespread exposure to talk would have been Muse Software's Castle Wolfenstein, which had, which had uh, digitized voice of Silas Warner saying various things in German like Achtung and so on. The first arcade games that spoke came out around 1980. Um, Berserk is probably the one that most people are familiar with in the American context. There was actually a Japanese game that did, uh, did this type of voice earlier. So this was actually a technology that would have blown people's minds at the time. The game itself, I don't want to oversell this. Bloody Murder itself was not a fantastic game. Uh, people would not have viewed it as somehow uh, incredible. Uh, it was a very simple game. You can see it barely had any uh, notion of score. Uh, Arthur Wells was known for being a regular contributor or semi-regular contributor to Dr. Dobbs's journal, which is a classic magazine. You could find most of these on the internet archive. I really do recommend taking a look. And here I found an article from him talking about how to do simple graphics on the Apple II in 1978. The other thing I found from him was a fairly snarky letter in Dr. Dobbs, talking about the issue of violence. He says, lastly, I note that all of the epic games to date involve war or fighting or conquering or some other form of aggressive competition. Shame, shame. We need games without such attributes. My modest proposal is a game called Ho-Hum. The game is played by any number of people communicating by modem. Players pretend they are at a social gathering. Each player can say whatever he wants, whenever he wants. The objective is to be so boorish, trite, and boring that no one wants to talk to you anymore. Players drop out when they can't stand it any longer or are bored out of their minds. The last player left is the winner. Uh, so, you know, 
to be maximum snarky here, he predicted the rise of the internet with his suggestion of, of the game. But he also talks about two other games with uh, fairly provocative names in this letter. So I have to believe that Bloody Murder was at least in part an attempt to make a, depending on what his intention was, either social commentary or a joke of sorts. So uh, Arthur, wherever you are, if you're still around, I would love to talk to you. Um, I, I think I, I know what he did after he w stopped doing computer programming and I've reached out to Mr. Wells and uh, you know maybe we'll uh, maybe we'll hear back from him. I know I'd love to do an interview with him and uh, find out a little more about Bloody Murder. He also made some other games the most famous of which is probably Micro League Baseball for the Apple II. So let's get back to the code. Let's look at these first few lines of code have to remember Apple II list sequence. And we can see the very first thing the code does is declare where this, where these binary bits are going to reside in memory. So my guess here, and this is only a guess, let's look at the size of those files. We've got sub BM two, three, and one, right? Okay, and what we see is sub BM two is very large. Uh, sub BM1 and sub BM3 are very small. My belief is that if we can figure out a way to look at these, we'll see that sub BM2 is the actual code, the meat of the game. Because there's actually quite a lot going on to animate those little, those little not sprites. And sub BM1 and 3, I think they're going to be either the graphical sprites themselves or the voice samples. So how can we know that? I'm not conversant in either Apple Talk or this character framework. Well, I'm gonna use a trick. Uh, hopefully it will work. Let's take a look. I'm going to pop the Apple II into graphics mode, except I'm not because HDR is not a command in Integer Basic. That's okay. We're gonna flip over to AppleSoft Basic because we don't need to be in Integer to do this. So sub-bm-1. What I'm going to do is I'm going to load that file and I'm going to tell the Apple to load it into the memory mapped graphics area. Let's see what we get. Okay, well that doesn't look very comprehensible. So I don't think that one is our sprite. Let's take a look. It could be our sprite. It could just simply be a kind of proto vector format. I was hoping we would actually see a sprite here. No, okay, so this isn't that useful here. So let's, that hack didn't work. Let's go into, let's see, I loaded it into 2000. I need to load it somewhere useful, huh? Let's load it at memory location 800. And let's take a look. I expect to see largely garbage here. Well, no, so this actually looks like it this could be coincidence. It certainly looks like valid code. So this is a small routine. And I don't believe it'll do anything if I, because I'm loading it in the wrong place in memory. Oh, look at that. All right. So that actually did a few things. So that is real code. That is clearly something to do with the graphics. Maybe it is page flipping of some sort. And I'm not going to look closely. I'm not going to go through this line by line or anything in this video, maybe in a future video. Let's take a look at BM1. This one I did look at, and I'm positive it's going to look like garbage. Yeah, so this one is almost certainly simply uh, data, perhaps the, the voice samples. And just to complete the trifecta, let's do this with sub BM2. You might wonder why am I using memory address 800? No reason. It's just that's what I always used to use when I was writing my own uh, assembly language programs which were tiny and so it's a habit I got into. It's probably a bad habit but I like knowing you know having a, a place that I can use by default and you can see this takes much longer to load because it is longer.
Yes, and this is real code as well. Um, would be interesting to kind of disassemble this, do a computer archaeology sort of dive into Bloody Murder and understand what each line of this program or each subroutine in this program is doing. Understanding each line in assembly language is very easy. It's putting it all together that is the tricky part. Well, let's go ahead and load this back in again. And let's just take one last look and see if there's anything here that is worth talking about. So we're loading these things into memory, then we start this drawing program which goes on for about that long. And this, I am confident, is just drawing the play field, all of those lines. And then around to 525, I think, is where the interesting stuff starts. All right, so that after drawing the play field, it goes to line 1100. So let's look at that. And that's where the program essentially starts, printing all of the instructions. Yikes. Right, lots of printing the instructions, getting the input from the user. There we go. And then going to line 525, which brings us to the observation that this is like not a lot of code to actually do things. So I'm reasonably sure that this Y chord and X chord stuff is the collision detection code and probably checking the position of the um, the paddles uh, or the the um, whether the your men should be moving left or right. So this has been Bloody Murder by Arthur Wells Jr. It is one of the weirdest little games that I know. Uh, I know I'm always finding these obscure games to show you and each week I'm trying to top myself. If you do have any suggestions for games that you remember from 1979 or have heard of that you'd like me to cover, please make a note in the comments. Uh, I do really live for your comments. I do like to, to hear what you have to say and I love to get new subscribers. So if you like me continuing to do this, please like, subscribe, and tell your friends. This has been Programming Like It's 1979. Thanks for watching.